Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Abby Stokes. I'm a counsel at Miller and Chevalier, a law firm here in DC. I practice government contracts at Miller. I joined Miller um, about a year ago after almost 10 years supporting the Navy, uh, the Navy Office of General Counsel, where I also practice government contracts law. During that time, I supported many different Navy clients, um, including many in the undersea community. I have also done quite a bit of work for the Navy Warfare Centers, including the initial competition and award of um, one of the Navy's first OTA consortiums up at Newick, which I hear is going quite well. So congratulations to the Navy and to you. U UTIC. Um, our firm recently joined Cenedia. We're really looking forward to working with you all. We're sorry we can't uh, be with you or anybody else in person today, um, but we're looking forward to supporting in whatever way we can. Um, just as a matter of logistics, we're recording today. We'll send the link to everybody afterwards and um, we'll also send the slides. If you could make sure that your microphones are on mute and we minimize the background noise as much as possible, it will make the presentation uh, seem more seamless. You should all automatically be on mute, but you might want to check that. Also, the platform, because we can't be with you in person, we let use the technology to make it as personal and engaging as possible. So please feel free to use that chat function. You can chat Miller and Chevalier to send a direct message, or you can chat the whole group so everybody can see your message. We're happy to engage as much as possible and make this as useful as possible for you all. Um, I'm joined today by, oh, also just a side note, um, our presentation today is not legal advice. It's sort of some high level issues we wanna talk with you all and, and make sure that they're flagged in your mind. But of course, we have to caveat that this itself is not legal advice, so. I'm joined today by four of my colleagues, each with unique um, areas of expertise. Alex Soria is with us today. He's a member at the firm. He also practices government contracts. He supported clients in high stakes government contracts related litigation. Preston Pugh is a member of the firm. Oh, you know what? Let me sure. There we go. Preston Pugh is a member of the firm's executive committee. He's defended employers in several employment cases that were tried before juries, including discrimination, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act and FMLA cases. He's also defended employers in government investigations, including OSHA investigations. Erin Sweeney is also a member of the firm. She's a former attorney with the Department of Labor, and she advises clients on all facets of healthcare and employee benefits. Jorge Castro is also a member of the firm. He advises uh, businesses on domestic and international tax issues. He brings with he brings a broad government experience, um, so having served as counselor to the IRS commissioner and senior tax counsel in Congress. So we've brought this diverse group of practitioners and distinct areas of expertise together today for a specific reason. The current COVID-19 situation is rapidly changing, creating many, for many of us, many issues we're aware of now and are already thinking about, but also some issues that were that are really unknown at this point. So the goal is really to bring together um, a diverse background of practitioners that can highlight issues for you all, questions that have been raised by our clients and companies, and more situations to many of yours. Um, hopefully, we're able to address questions that you're currently thinking about and maybe flag some that you haven't considered so far. Then, please feel free to ask questions about the presentation. Of course, after the presentation, if you have you weren't able to ask, if we weren't able, able to get to anything, or new issues come up later, we're available. Um, our contact information is here. We'll make sure you all get it, and you should feel free to reach out anytime with any questions. So, quickly, this is what we're going to talk about today. I'll give a quick just overview to sort of set the stage, and then we're going to go, we're going to talk a bit about business and the impact from a, from a contracting perspective. We benefit employment and crisis management, and tax issues. 
Also, I, I just said this a couple of times. Please feel free to, free to ask questions during the presentation, and we'll try to hit them as we're going. Instead, you don't have to wait to the end. Good mic. Yes. Was somebody asking a question? Abby, the audio is a little bit choppy uh, coming from from your system. You may uh, just try to turn the video off, and that may uh, give us a little more bandwidth for the audio. Does this make it better? Um, it sound it I, we could hear you. It was just more choppy, like there was you know just a bit of an issue with the um, with the, the the available bandwidth sending the audio through. Okay, can you? Tell me how to turn my video off. You want me to do that? On the control, uh, actually, hang on one second here. Okay, it's off. Okay, um, is that better or choppy? Can anybody hear me okay? Yeah, I think it sounds a little better now. Okay, I apologize. Technical difficulties. I, I think literally the entire world is trying to get um, online from home right now. So maybe that's it. So just see, this is uh, the map that we're seeing from the CDC, where um, sort of showing where where cases of COVID nineteen are popping up. Um, the map is changing every day. It's just a nice graphic to look at, or not so nice. Um, so this is a situation, COVID-19 is a rapidly changing situation. Uh, we're all tracking, I'm sure, following the news, but just to set the stage, um, the World Health Organization on March officially declared the spread of COVID-19 a pandemic, which means that it's worldwide. The White House has recently issued guidance, of course, to stay home if you're sick, work from home or school from home if all possible. Um, avoid social gatherings of more than 10 people, avoid restaurants, bars, travel. Each state is issuing their own rules and mandates. I know that my family um, in California has been they're on lockdown now for the second day with a threat of misdemeanor if they don't follow the rules. So this is a really si serious situation and we're all working hard to implement the measures that we need to implement. Um, I, I pulled this uh, number up from of the total cases we see last night. I heard on the news today that it's already changed. So this is a really rapidly evolving situation. Um, the Department of Navy also, I'm sure many of you have already um, seen this, but on March 13th, the Department of Defense, I should say, um, issued a stop movement for domestic travel that includes uh, all DOD uh, dom domestic travel, including family members, which is quite a big deal. Um, the Navy, I, I haven't seen, we've been watching and haven't seen anything official um, come analogous to the DOD guidance, um, but there is some useful guidance on uh, Mr. Archansky, the executive director of NAVC, issued some specific guidance to government employees posted on their website, and it provides a lot of useful I think one of the most useful things from that from that uh, guidance is the term calm urgency. So this is a, a very big deal. It's urgent. We all need to uh, do what we need to do to respond to it. Um, but I like the use of the word calm as, as leaders within your organizations. Of course, there are people that are scared and this is, uh, this is a time to stay calm and provide um, urgent, calm, urgent leadership. Something to note about Mr. Smirchansky's guidance and any other guidance you're seeing from the government. Uh, it's applicable to government employees, so it is not applicable to contractors. It's useful in to understand where the government's per, per, um, lines is, but it does not change the terms of your contract. So any guidance you're seeing necessarily, I should say, any guidance you're seeing about telework or measures to take unless it's directed at you or specifically at government contractors, don't assume it's going to change any terms in your contract. So 
just as um, an initial matter as well, we, we are fully cognizant that our first priority as businesses is to keep our people safe and healthy. I think this is important from both a human perspective as well as a business perspective. Um, we also have to work to avoid unnecessary risk as a business, um, including cost risk and, and otherwise. And that's really why, why we're here today is to help our potential risks, whether they're now or long-term risks. I would also just say for a member of the Navy opposition community for the last years, I know how mission driven we are. Um, we're all here to get the job done. I also know many of the questions and concerns that we're getting from clients across in industries is really how do we continue to meet requirements? So nobody's trying to stop work. Everybody trying to get the job done. Um, it's just important to point out while trying to get this job done, these are the types of situations where we do often see people, both government and contractors, bend rules to get those jobs done. Welcome to WebEx. Enter your access code or meeting number followed by pound. I think we had somebody join that's not on mute. Can everybody try to make sure that you're mm -hmm. on mute? Um, so, all that to say, uh, when we see people uh, flexing to sort of get the job done can often, especially on the government contract side, result in uh, tricky legal issues in the long run. So, you're trying to get reimbursed for costs that you had to incur in order to get that job done, or you didn't meet performance requirements to get a, a specific incentive feedback. Um, there are things that we can do on the front end to try to that turning into a dispute in the back end. Um, so our goal here today is to avoid those tricky situations later. And with that, we'll try to do government contracts and pass it over to Alex Soria. Thank you, Abby. Good morning, everybody, uh, and uh, thank you for for joining today. So. In the government contract space, what what are we starting to to see um, based on our discussions with clients? It, it really you know comes as no surprise at this point that um, we're starting to see challenges uh, in the contracting process, administration of both prime contracts and subcontracts at all levels, uh, as a result of some of the disruption that you're seeing in supply chains, uh, the ability to access labor and uh, the ability to travel, right, where that's required to, to perform uh, requirements. Um, the two, I think, biggest categories of impact here really break down into the labor impacts and then the impacts on sources of supply, and I'll take each of those in turn. So in terms of labor impacts that we're seeing both at the prime and sub levels is you know, we're getting a lot of questions from companies that are either considering or um, thinking about uh, the need in the near future to go to a telework model or to sort of a skeleton crew or a mission essential labor model um, where, you know, it's, it's necessary to protect the health and safety of your own workforce. Um, you know, you also see these impacts, obviously, in contracts that require a physical presence for performance, right? Not all of us have the luxury of uh, being able to telework where you're you're accessing, you know, your work, and you can you can actually work through um, uh, any delays or any pauses uh, in in the work environment virtually, right? So if you are in a in a manufacturing setting or other setting that requires you to be physically present, that obviously uh, is an area where we're seeing a lot of issues. And then certainly where uh, you've got contracts or subcontracts that require uh, a fair amount or a significant amount of travel, right? And that can be, uh, uh, you know, that can pop up, is popping up in areas where you have multiple uh, facilities involved in the performance of a particular program, whether it's air travel, tra rail travel, or, or just driving around, we're starting to see, you know, some constraints there, obviously, based on um, the limitations that are being imposed both by DOD, as Abby mentioned, um, by the government itself, certainly doesn't impact contractors at this point. But, um, you know, you can see the government starting to move in the direction of 
of restricting travel. Um, uh, and so, you know, you also have local state and municipal ordinances that are that are starting to restrict travel and the movement of people. So that's having an impact um, on on the labor that uh, you're bringing to bear on your prime contracts and subcontracts. In terms of sources of supply, again, this is you know probably not news to anybody, but you you're potentially facing uh, you know delayed delivery of of critical components or parts that you need, spares and repairs, that sort of stuff for. Uh, weapon systems or other systems that uh, you need to keep online or that you're working on developing. Um, you know, the unavailability, just straight unavailability of particular items um, uh, or components that are coming from particular parts of the world, right? Uh, you know, there are companies, countries that are fully on lockdown that, um, you know, have ordered their manufacturing operations in some cases to, uh, to, to, to grind to a halt. Italy is one of the more one of the more notable examples, but certainly France is in, in I think, uh, heading in the same direction if it's not already there. So, um, you know, that leads to questions uh, at the contractual level, both as a prime and as a sub, as to your ability to, to substitute um, those components, uh, look for alternative sources of supply, uh, while also complying with other requirements in your contract. So a lot of what we'll be talking about today is sort of the secondary uh, effects of not only the coronavirus on uh, and how that fits into the the normal government contracts construct, but how you know in dealing with some of the things that are changing, it, you know, on it, in the administration of government contracts, what are the what are the uh, consequences that can have down the line? An example here is if you're substituting uh, or looking to substitute particular components, does that have uh, an impact on? For example, how you are uh, calculating your Buy American Act compliance uh, in terms of the cost of the components test. Uh, if you're unable to source from particular countries that um, you know are, are part of your plan for being TAA compliant, Trade Agreements Act compliant, is that now impacted by uh, your ability to, to source from those locations? So those secondary order effects, I think, are things that that folks um, are, are starting to see, starting to think through, um, and um, you know, it, it likely will continue um, as as things progress here. Ultimately, the point, though, I think that that is on most folks' mind is, um, you know, how do we deal with uh, some of the cost impacts and the performance impacts that are resulting from uh, from the outbreak here? And the way we've been thinking about it in terms of the, you know, how we're counseling clients is. Uh, you know, things that you need to be on the lookout for, right? A lot of this uh, is all still very brand new in terms of its actual impact on the performance of your contracts. Uh, as Abby mentioned, um, you know, this stuff may not yet be um, actually resulting in uh, changes or direction by the government, but it may soon result in changes or direction from the government as, as to how to, you know, implement workarounds or how to think through your ability to continue performance uninterrupted. But the way we're thinking about it, you know, as we say here on the slide is, you know, try to try to categorize this in terms of um, your need for offensive relief uh, from the things that are changing under your contract, and then your need for defensive relief. And, and what we mean by offensive relief here is, um, you know, lots of companies are, uh, for example, thinking of going to a telework model. Well, that that comes with additional cost. And if you are um, uh, looking uh, to do that under a fixed price contract, the question there is, can I seek an equitable adjustment from the government to recover my increased cost of performance? Or um, if, you know, the, the requirements of my contract, the schedule requirements and the delivery schedule actually incorporated in my contract, if I'm seeing that there, there are uh, source of supply issues or uh, delivery delay issues that are going to impact my ability to meet that schedule, what are the, the clauses and what are the remedy granting provisions of my contract that I need to be able to access to seek uh, perhaps a schedule extension from the government itself? And so, the way we've been thinking about this really in the first instance is to uh, really focus on the changes provisions of your contracts. 
changes clauses generally are going to be the the main remedy granting provisions from an offensive perspective is there are changes that you need to make or that are being um, uh, sort of catalyzed by the impacts of the coronavirus um, looking to your changes clause and understanding the relief that's available the types of adjustments that you can seek from the government and then also the monetary or time relief that you need from the government really is going to be wrapped up in in those changes provisions the key here though from an offensive perspective is not to simply assume that uh, you're going to be entitled to the relief that that you think you need, right? So, uh, you know, on, on, for all the folks on the phone who are cost reimbursement contractors or time and materials contractors, you know, the risk of increased cost of performance on on those uh, types of contracts certainly is lessened, right? You are generally permitted to recover your increased cost of performance so long as they're allowable and they within you know the not to exceed limits of your contract but if you are performing under a fixed price contract the cost risk cost risk generally is borne by the contractor and so what we've been advising companies to do regardless of the type of contract that you have is to really engage with your customers i know it seems uh perhaps an, to be an overly simplistic point but the key to unlocking uh, the relief that's available under your changes clauses really is going to be direction from the government, written direction from the United States telling you, okay, uh, we hear, you know, we understand that you're considering a telework model. We understand that's going to require adjustments to the following three or four provisions of your contract. We also understand that um, that could cause your cost to increase um, by X percentage or may require us to. Uh, increase the fee on your contract. Certainly, you know the government's not going to articulate uh, the the relief that you need for you as a as a as a contractor, right? And so it's incumbent upon companies to think through. Okay, these are the terms and conditions of my existing contract. That is the baseline of performance that we agreed to, uh, either with the United States or with my higher tier customer. How are things changing, and what are the what are the the things that actually need to change in the contract itself, uh, either through a modification or some other direction from the United States that will get me the relief that I need to continue doing the work? Um, in the second category, it's really you know thinking through the need potentially for defensive relief um, based on government or customer initiated direction, right? So. Uh, certainly, the government could initiate changes itself, right? If if you are in a in a facility where you've got government personnel and contractor personnel co-located, um, you know, as a result of some of the government's own telework policies going into place, and and you know, as Abby mentioned, one would expect that that will start to happen here potentially in the next couple of weeks. Um, will that result in direction from the government to remove? Uh, your own personnel from that co-located facility and move them to a telework model. And what are the impacts of that, right? And what's the relief available under your changes clauses? You know, down the road, what you might start to see if if things um, are, you know, continue to grow in terms of how challenging they are, are you know, cure notices about uh, either delayed performance or performance deficiencies that the government or your customers identifying and giving you an opportunity really is a precursor to, to potential termination for convenience or a termination for default, an opportunity to explain uh, why your delay or performance deficiency might be excused under, for example, an excusable delay clause. Um, other direction might come in the form of a stop work order where the government uh, under the FAR is permitted to order a stop work, just you know, freeze performance largely for a period of up to 90 days initially, and then that can be extended by agreement of the parties beyond getting a notice like that and understanding um, you know, what are your obligations as a contractor during the stop work period, which include taking reasonable steps to minimize the cost to the government. So uh, you know, if you think about it in terms of uh, offensive relief and, and, and unlocking you know, the, the potential and, and the, the, the different provisions of your changes clauses to make sure that you can continue performing, and then also preparing for um, you know, any government direction that may itself modify what you are doing, uh, that's really the way that, you know, we recommend thinking about it. I think the last point on this slide that I'll make before I turn it over to Abby is keep an eye out for, um, you know, subtle direction from the government or actions from the government 
that can result in a constructive change to your contract. So it's one thing to receive, you know, a, a modification from your CO or um, an email from your CO directing you to do something very specific uh, and recognizing that it may result in a cost impact. But in the real world, the way this often works, especially in a situation this fluid, is that you may get government direction or you may get um, something that the government is actually doing, closing a base, closing your access to a site that, you know, in and of itself changes your ability to perform the contract, that probably falls into the, the category of a constructive change. Uh, and if it does, just know, you know, as many do on this, on this call, that that also would entitle you to seek uh, relief either in the form of uh, recovering your increased cost of performance or additional time to perform your, your obligations under the, under the contract. Excuse me, thanks, Alex. Um, well, it seems like I've had the most technical difficulties. So, if somebody could give me a quick sign that you can hear me, that would be great. Can you hear me? Hear, yeah, I can hear you. It's, a, it's still a little choppy, but I think a little better. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for the note. Um, Okay, so so yeah, like Alex said, we just wanted to quickly highlight for you some of the questions. These might be the types of questions. Um, that you all are asking. These are some of the questions that we hear people asking. But for example, what should I do if my employees can't work? Um, what should I do if my employees um, or can my can my employees telework based on this health guidance? But let's say, for example, they're embedded contractors and the they're still folks are still going to work at the at the site. Um, can I have them 100% telework, even though the contract doesn't contemplate 100% telework? What should I do if my suppliers or my subcontractors can't deliver? Or conversely, if you are the supplier or subcontractor, what should I do if I can't deliver? What should I do if I'm experiencing increased costs or performance delays under, for example, a fixed price contract or a fixed price incentive contract? So there's there's a, a litany of questions that come up that are similar to these, and they're all somewhat tricky. Um, each scenario, of course, will be fact dependent, but there are some common themes that to keep in mind. This is really sort of a dovetail from all of the concepts that Alex just mentioned. But <clears throat> common themes are that the compliance requirements remain. So the terms of your contract are your legal obligations, and this includes OTAs. Um, this is an important time to look closely at your contract terms um, and understand what's required. So your specifications are still your specifications. Um, the contract terms, I, I highlight the OTAs here because there, uh, you know, the, there are terms in FAR based contracts that we're all used to, and we can kind of scan and go and look for them. The changes clause, excusable delay, all of these things, they're, they're in most of those contracts. OTAs are, as we know, a, a different, a different, to not include all of those same terms. So it's important to know what is or what isn't in there, and what your obligations are under those terms. Um, other compliance requirements are the Buy American Act, Trade Agreements Act. You know, if you have to sub out a new supplier, first of all, what does your contract say about subbing out new supplier? Also, be aware you are obligated to comply with those requirements, and you, you're going to need to do that analysis to ensure that those new uh, so sources of supply are in compliance. Um, because you are certifying in almost all cases that you are in compliance. Um, another, your cybersecurity requirements still apply. This is an important one to highlight, especially as we're moving to um, probably 100% telework wherever possible for most organizations. Um, this is going to be of high concern. Our systems are, most people's, most organization systems are not uh, ready for that level of of remote work, so we need to make sure we're taking whatever steps we can to make sure that we're still in compliance with the cybersecurity requirements. And of course, in the DOD context, hopefully even um, ahead, of, ahead of the curve, which is what they're really looking for right now. Uh, labor charging is also another area that we need to be extra careful of. This is a, a, a high risk area, especially for 
we might see later. So labor charging, they're always looking at labor charging and, and given that most of us are not used to 100% telework situations, we need to make sure we have the proper um, fixes in place or procedures in place so that folks are, are properly charging the contract and that you can justify and support those charges later if you're ever asked about them. Um, your fixed price scope remains your fixed price scope. Whatever is in that contract is what the scope is. If you're asked to operate outside of it, uh, you, you need to understand what exactly that means. And um, <clears throat> there's repeating that any changes will only be legally allowable and reimbursable with the appropriate approval level. So, meaning the contracting officer. So, if your program manager is telling you something, that's great. Make sure you get it in writing from your contracting officer. So, Alex, you want to talk? Here's the sort of highlight of some of the clauses. Sure, sure. So, you know, the question now is sort of how to prepare, and we um, we've covered. Uh, some of this a bit already. Um, what we've provided here is uh, an overarching menu of the most common FAR clauses that you're likely to see that you know will govern um, the remedies and the relief available uh, either to the government or to you as a contractor. A lot of these clauses uh, may not be flowed down, um, you know, one for one to lower tier uh, entities, but uh, you will see certainly see um, at least tailored versions of these provisions included in your contracts one way or the other, wherever you find yourself on the contracting chain. So you know, we recognize this is a, a fairly diverse crowd of companies uh, on the phone here. And so this is not intended to, to be a one-stop shop for all the clauses that are that are relevant. But I think that the point here, and, and Abby made it a second ago, which is you know, it's really important to, to take the time at, at at this point, I think to think through and understand the provisions that are, are in your contract. So, you know, basic hygiene here, pardon the pun, is you know, what what clauses does your does your contract include? But also equally important, what's missing, right? What might you um, need to go back to your contracting officer or to your your higher tier customer um, uh, to you know to to have included in your contract if it's not there for example if you don't see an excusable delay clause in your contract and you're concerned uh, that you know for whatever reason you may either run into uh, labor issues or source of supply issues that we were describing earlier you may pay to uh, now raise your hand and ask for the inclusion of an excusable delay clause um, not as a, a way of sort of Precursing or, or, or signaling that you are going to run into delays, but if the clause is mandatory and it ought to be there, now would be the time to, to I think, make sure that uh, it's appropriately included where it's mandatory. Um, you know, then really the next step down is uh, understanding what are the, the requirements, right, for obtaining relief. So a lot of the clauses that are included on this chart. Um, as many know, where it's the government giving a contractor direction, for example, to. Uh, implement a change uh, to their supplies or services that they're delivering, their delivery schedule or their method of performance, or if the government is directing a contractor to stop work or terminate a portion of its contract uh, performance for convenience, the government's always going to include or should include instructions uh, to, to the contractor and, and a contractor then turns around if it impacts their lower tier suppliers should include instructions to those lower tier suppliers about what to do and what not to do, not placing further subcontracts, um, stopping work on the terminated uh, portions of work, um, uh, of, of the statement of work, stopping work in certain areas, but not stopping work in others, minimizing costs in certain areas, but not um, you know, changing things in other areas. So understanding you know, the types of instructions that you're likely to see and really, you know, preparing to implement those faithfully, uh, I think is is something that could really pay off here. The other thing to, to observe about all of these clauses that, or, or many of them certainly have uh, timing provisions or, or time frame requirements uh, that are imposed on contractors if they do want to seek relief in terms of more more uh, time to perform or if they want to recover increased cost of performance. 
the best example of that is in your, your standard changes clauses, generally the rule is that you have 30 days to assert your right uh, to either an equitable adjustment of money or time. And so observing those timeframes, making sure that your folks are, again, primed to, to be able to comply and submit um, a request for equitable adjustment where necessary, um, you know, th th those could be time barred. They can certainly be waived by, by contracting officers, but making sure that you understand what those timeframes are, I think, is the first step. And then what are the requirements for documenting the impacts to your performance, right? So if you are going to submit a request for equitable adjustment, uh, understanding what it takes to uh, submit a, an REA that is well supported and documented with the information that the government's going to need to be able to grant you uh, relief uh, without, you know, uh, getting into any audits or questioning costs or, you know, worse. So um, understanding the requirements of the clauses, I think, uh, is, is, is good to just refresh on. Certainly nobody needs to, to memorize each and every one of these clauses. Uh, that's, you know, that's for, for geeks like us to, to do in our spare time. But, um, you know, again, just familiarizing yourself with the general rules of the road in these pockets of, of likely um, uh, change uh, or, 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 you know, that that's, uh, I think, can pay off quite a bit. In the miscellaneous category here, I'll mention uh, two, two areas, right? So there's uh, the DFARS clause that we mentioned here that, that's titled Continuation of Essential Contractor Services. As, as many of you uh, may know, this clause uh, it, you know, potentially is included in many of your contracts, um, but it requires contractors to develop um, plans for ensuring that essential services uh, can continue to be provided even in a scenario where um, you know, there are significant impacts to your ability to work. And uh, so the government can call for those plans uh, at any time under this clause. Uh, contractors certainly are, are uh, required to, to be prepared to provide those plans, but if you've got this clause in your contract, I think that's one uh, that at this point it may, may make sense to, to take a look at and make sure that you'd be, you are prepared to comply if the government requests um, your, your plan to continue essential services. And the last one I'll mention is special H clauses, right? So beyond FAR clauses, beyond other standard terms and conditions, uh, special H clauses, a lot of times, as uh, many on this phone call know, uh, will uh, sneak in requirements that uh, often go overlooked. Um, and so that's another area of your contracts that uh, we're recommending you, you go back and take a look at to understand um, you know, how they might come into play and how might they impact your, uh, your ability to either seek uh, relief from the government for changes that are occurring under your contract or also, um, you know, understanding your, your terms and conditions and your compliance obligations should the government question the timing or quality of your performance. Great. Um, so just quick takeaways, how to prepare things to be thinking about on the government contract side. Um, again, sort of reiterating, and especially for, I know folks in the undersea community up there have really great relationships with your customers. So engage your customers and um, increase those lines of communication that I'm sure are already there. Um, so if, if you do see an issue popping up, um, early notice is important um, to, to your customers. Make sure, um, keep in mind when you do provide that notice and any of those communications, you want to make sure you also provide an assurance of continued performance. So you, what you don't want is to find yourself in a situation where the government takes your um, increased line of communication and notice of potential issues as uh, anticipatory repudiation, some sort of signal that you're not going to be able to perform unless you actually mean that, um, make sure you are saying, you are making it very clear that you do intend to and you will continue to perform. Um, follow all government instructions closely and get all instructions in writing um, from the contracting officer. Again, you're probably communicating with more people than just the contracting officer right now, who of course have a lot of insight into what's going on and what they do, want you to do, be doing or not doing. But if you're going to be doing anything that's outside of the scope of your current contract um, or um, changes anything, 
or approvals for things that you need to be doing, make sure you get those in writing from the contracting officer. And of course, if you receive any sort of stop work orders or terminations, follow those government instructions early and consult um, consult legal right away on those, um, your in-house or, or in whatever capacity. Um, and again, this is another um, issue that bears repeating over and over in the government contracts arena, and I'm sure you all say it on a daily basis as well, but document, document, document. So communications, actions, increased costs, document, it's really, it's, it's much easier to avoid a dispute if you have clear documentation um, at the outset, rather than having to go back and try to figure out what happened and, and, and explain it later. Right, and the, the last thought we'll leave you with on the government contracts front is you know, recognizing that things are moving uh, at the speed of light here in many instances. Um, you know, the companies that are best positioned to, uh, to deal with uh, the impacts of, of this virus, I think, um, are the ones that are doing uh, the risk-based planning ahead of time, right? Not being purely reactive. And so when we see what, what clients are, are doing in this space, the ones that uh, appear to be most prepared are those that are developing uh, risk matrix matrices, matrices and other planning documents that help them categorize risk, uh, you know, in terms of their probability and their impact. So as we mentioned here on the slide, there, there are going to be risks that fall into a category of high probability, high impact. Those are the most existential, the pro problematic ones, um, and, and uh, so on and so forth. There are different permutations of probability and impact from a risk standpoint. Um, you know, the, the, the companies that, again, are best positioned here, I think, are the ones that are, are developing workarounds based on the risk categorization that they're doing and those that are prioritizing their resources and mitigation actions based on the risks that are, are most likely to occur, not only, but also those that uh, would have the greatest impact. And, and so, you know, it's easy, I think, to uh, in, in situations here where uh, you've got uh, issues coming up all, you know, one after another to maybe take a first in, first out approach. It's important, I think, in the midst of that to take a step back and try to understand how they fit into uh, your priorities and which of those need to be dealt with first in terms of, uh, you know, both timing, but also the resources that you dedicate uh, to, um, to, to trying to mitigate them. Um, Abby, it looks like we've got a, a question here. You, um, can you see it better? I think I've fixed my audio, but I can't see the chat. Yeah, so we, we've got allowable costs. Yeah, so we got a question here. If we allow employees to charge negative PTO beyond what they have earned, and this results in a large unfavorable burden, is this still an allowable cost and does it run the risk uh, of an audit by DCA for excess PTO or some such? I think um, the, the answer to this question in some ways is going to uh, depend not only on you know, the terms and conditions of your contract, uh, but also, um, you know, the understanding that you have with the government in terms of how PTO is being charged, right? So if you've got um, a pricing model or a cost model under your contract that is uh, based on what you normally do uh, with PTO in, you know, in, in different circumstances, any change, I think, as a result of this uh, outbreak um, I, you know, you sort of risk uh, that DCAA or the government may later on take the position that it was a surprise. And so, again, I think, you know, the, the, best, the best approach here is to, um, you know, understand uh, not only what you've signed up for and what you've indicated to the government your normal procedures are uh, in terms of charging this, this type of cost, but to make it allowable um, or to ensure that it's allowable is to get on the same page with your customer and, and, and making sure that they understand what it is that you're proposing to do. Because, you know, the question raises a really good point where, you know, DCA audits uh, of, of the costs that you're incurring now under these contracts, those very well could be uh, coming down the road here. Certainly we, we know that they will do that uh, at some point. Um, and when they do it, you know, it's easy, I think, 
you know, whether it's six months down the road, eight months down the road or longer, uh, it's easy to sort of forget that, um, you know, we were dealing with uh, a challenging sort of brand new um, uh, type of issue. And so making sure, I think on the front end, that you're on the same page with the government. And as Abby mentioned, documenting that understanding will go a long way to reducing your audit risk uh, and the risk for uh, cost disallowance down the road. Well, we're going to, uh, we just took up way more time than we were supposed to on government contracts. So we're going to move ahead um, and jump into employee benefits. Erin, are you on? Yes, I'm on. Here we go. Okay. Um, so we've all been talking about, um, you know, how we're going to provide these services under the contracts. Well, Obviously, one of the very important issues that we have to deal with is how are you going to ensure the health of your workforce so they can provide the necessary services. So, um, in this space, what we're, um, we're, we're advising is the first thing to do, read your health plan or policy. So, you need to take a look at the actual document that's providing the benefits to your people. But in addition, there's also a contract that you need to take a look at, which is the contract either with your health insurance carrier or with your third party administrator. So this is the document finds the, the contractual arrangement between either if you have a fully insured product, the insurance carrier, or if you have a self-insured plan, a third party administrator. So um, and, and, and the reason why this matters is because what you're gonna wanna understand here is just as we've been talking about in the government contracts arena is under your health plan or under your agreement with your third party administrator or your issuer, what kind of flexibility do you have to, to modify provisions? What kind of discretion could there be to interpret these provisions? And do you need to reach out to your third party administrator? Um, some of the big issues that we've been dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis in this space are testing, um, and, you know, testing and telehealth, and then you know, sort of a general sort of grab bag of different provisions in your health plan. And so, testing, of course, the biggest issue has been on everyone's minds is is how is how to get the test and who qualifies. And 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 as as we've as we've mentioned multiple times. This landscape is is changing in, in an instant, even who who can get the test where it's available. Um, but we have gotten some helpful guidance from the government individuals who are covered by an HSA and a high deductible health plan. And and what this product is, is um, and, and again, and of course, we're in the very beginning of the year. So a lot of people haven't satisfied their deductible. What an HSA high deductible health plan provides is that in an effort to ensure that our employees have some skin in the game, these, these plans, what they do is they require the employee to make a, a large upfront um, deductible payment before the health plan can start to provide any coverage. And so one of the very first reactions from, from the IRS um, and, and people reaching out to the IRS is how can we make sure that we get people tested? Because as everyone knows from the infectious disease experts, the, getting the testing done um, is the, really the most important way to contain the pandemic. And if people are reluctant to get tested because they believe that test is not gonna be covered by the health plan, then that can become a, a you know, a, a make a crisis even more of a crisis. And so what the IRS did is they said, uh, you know, the, the critical words that the IRS came, came out with is they, they said that all medical services received and items purchased that are associated with testing and treatment of COVID-19 can be provided under the health plan. So what this tries to do is eliminate that barrier to care and to testing that will make everyone healthier. Um, I think what's been very interesting now in the last, you know, that guidance came out now, it seems like a hundred years ago, but, um, you know, because that was only two weeks ago and in this in this very fast moving climate, um, we, we've already had changes. And so what's happened since that guidance has been issued is most 
providers of medical services are moving to a telehealth only model so that if you're you know your your child's pediatrician or um, you know any kind of care provider your um, counselors are going to either phone they're going to um, telehealth the real question and, and sort of the you know all all um, all this week the question and, and and starting some last week is well is that covered? Like, you know, can do do you still have to then satisfy the deductible if you're going to have all of um, your services provided by telehealth? When in fact, it's not even an option anymore. I mean, in most facilities and medical service providers are simply not providing any level of coverage other than telehealth. And you know, where where I've been focusing on is there's one sentence uh, um, in in the guidance from the IRS that says that. Um, and, and this is actually, I think it started out trying to be the IRS being, you know, limiting, you know, limiting the guidance where they said, you know, this guidance does not modify previous guidance with respect to the requirements to be a high deductible health plan in any manner other than with respect to testing for treatment and treatment of COVID-19. And, you know, the question that really has sort of been the crux of this is, is, is telehealth for every other specialty, um, is it mandated for um, um, for treatment of COVID-19? And my argument is is that it is. I mean, if 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 what our our leaders and our government and um, and what the medical service providers and infectious disease experts are telling us is that it's mandated to have people stay at home and therefore receive telehealth, then that's because of COVID-19. So, um, you know, and again, um, the the question that is asked here um, about to what extent does HIPAA and additional privacy laws and regulations apply to disclosure and employee health condition to the government, um, just to take on some of, you know, some of the, you know, the HIPAA pieces of this as well, is uh, HHS has just released guidance saying that, um, that it's okay um, to have a telehealth service provider. And we just heard this morning, because I know this was an issue I was dealing with last week and Monday, which was what happens with your telehealth provider, let's say in the tri-state area, like in the DC area, what if the provider is licensed, not licensed in Maryland, but they provide this is normally in their office in DC, but all a lot of their patients are in Maryland. Like what about the licensing, the state licensing? Well, now we know that HHS is working very closely with all of the states to um, allow um, a relaxation of the ability to receive services by telehealth across metropolitan areas. And so you should, we'll continue to see uh, developments on that front. This is again, very much evolving and changing. Um, but one of the questions also that's been raised is what about business associate agreements, right? I mean, uh, how is everyone all of a sudden we're, we're trying to provide services and um, there are different platforms and there may not be business associate agreements in place. And, um, and what, um, what HHS has said is that um, you can go ahead and provide the services that they expect that there will be an effort to set up and um, establish business associate agreements um, going forward, they've also indicated that the telehealth services can be provided under what they call um, non-public facing remote communications projects. So this is like FaceTime, Facebook, uh, Facebook Messenger video, chat, Google Hangouts, Skype. Um, but what you can't do is provide telehealth over Facebook Live, Twitch, TikTok, um, these types of platforms. So, um, you know, and on the flip side, what we're hearing from um, you know, carriers, insurance carriers, is they have their co-parties to business associate agreements saying, well, we need to waive the security requirements or we want indemnity or we, you know, we, we want to modify our contract, our business associate contract. And, um, and so there's a real push and pull here because, you know, some of the questions that are being raised by the insurance carriers are, well, you know, we, why should we waive any of our protections? I mean, you need to you need to provide this information, and you need you need to fulfill your contract. And so that dialogue is happening right now. Um, but just to touch on the point of of the HIPAA laws uh, that directly to this question, um, you know, HIPAA always had an exception for providing information to a public health authority such as the CDC. So um, it, you know, that's you know. It, Although we're dealing with some of these issues and they seem relatively novel 
and um, and certainly it's the only pandemic everyone um, on this call has been aware of in their lifetime. And so, um, you know, I think that part of it is also remembering some of the the bricks that were already there in place. And so, uh, there are like five or six different provisions that were baked into HIPAA that will allow these types of disclosures. But um, just wanted to mention a couple other points on on my on my first slide here, and then I, I'll I'll, I'll move over and let some of my other colleagues talk a little bit about other issues. Um, I would just point out that um, the government has indicated that um, that that Medicare and um, Medicaid can um, provide testing um, and treatment for um, the coronavirus without uh, a deductible or with even any cost sharing and that that's not considered to be an anti kickback violation. Um, you know, there have been some issues and this goes to like what your health plan actually says is the drive by testing that's now being conducted in 10 states. Is that covered? And again, look at your plan and um, and, and see what you can um, interpret from that plan. Uh, I know there's been a lot of questions about preventative care for asymptomatic individuals. Like, is there anything that asymptomatic individuals can have access to, whether it's antibiotics? Of course, no one can get masks or, or hand sanitizer at this point. Um, but you know, these are really they're unanswered questions about what asymptomatic individuals might be able to have access to. So if we go to the next slide. So if we can, uh, well, okay, so the next, I just wanted to raise, a, you know, a, a couple of points here. Um, telehealth snap-ons, um, what we, what, um, what was really going on last week was a number of third-party administrators told employers that um, we're going to offer a telehealth benefit and we're going to offer a telehealth benefit, not just to people who are covered by your health plan, but to your entire workforce. And you have 24 hours to, um, to say that you're not participating or we're offering it. And this is a kind of benefit that the employer pays like per use. So every person who uses their telehealth, then the employer would be charged for that. And some of the questions that um, really have started were circulating last week is, well, wait a minute, if you provide just telehealth and these are all these people who are not on the health plan, that snap on isn't, Aren't those people then they have a health plan under ERISA, but it doesn't provide ACA coverage, minimum health, minimum essential coverage, and and what to do from there, and um and and really you know facts and circumstances have really just sort of um you know overtaken a lot of these events, and and of course the entire pandemic as really a tsunami moving forward, and you know my view on that is that you know our regulators are you know going to provide us guidance in a timely fashion when they can and that um, it's hard to imagine regulators treating these types of responses really to an emergency as violations and so we should not expect to see for example our regulators you know after we're we're past um, the curve and and we are turned the corner that our regulators are suddenly going to issue million dollar assessments um, on uh, under the Employer Shared Responsibility Act because people tried to act in an emergency in a way that was helpful to their employees. Um, just also just a couple points here. Right now, a lot of plans have these provisions about required travel for center of excellence surgery. Like you have to go, like one of the plans that I was looking at, um, all joint replacement surgery had to com be completed in Washington state, which is you know one of the centers of the coronavirus. And so you know the question here is, um, is interpreting your plan, working with your providers to create amendments because no one is traveling for joint surgery right now. And in fact, um, as we as we have heard a couple days ago, um, at least in New York City, there's no elective surgery um, of any kind. Everything's phasing out, and that ultimately, what our what our hospitals are going to be providing from now until the end of the pandemic is they're going to be converting their regular beds to ICU beds. They're going to be finding out who can run ventilators and try to move the entire hospital system in a different direction. So um, the question is, you know, while these some somewhat academic at this point, because um, I actually believe that all hospital systems are going to start to follow the New York model. Um, just a couple of points about quarantine. Um, we just note that the um, the government has provided us relief on Medicare about um, 
making it clear that if, if a person actually doesn't satisfy the, the definition for acute patient care, but that ultimately a decision is made that this person needs to stay in quarantine, then Medicare will continue to pay in a, uh, at the um, acute patient care facility, as well as give that person a, a access to a private room as they would need with coronavirus. And um, and that they would not be charged an additional deductible. So on the Medicare side, we're we're seeing help on that front. Um, other questions, such as you know, at the beginning we had people who were quarantined at U.S. Air Force bases. Now we do have some quarantine that's still being undertaken um, by particular localities because they have homeless people who have coronavirus, and they they have hotels in certain cases where they're where they are quarantining people. The question is, you know, who's paying, who's sharing? Um, you know, so far the you know HHS and CDC have been providing medications to people, even those medications that they need on a regular basis. But it's you know it's a real question of, of you know who's responsible and how that will work out. Um, but um, but in any event, these are you know these are just some of the the high level issues um, and employee benefits. And again, it's very much of an evolving landscape. But did want to touch on some of the issues to. Um, to um, to sort of get everyone going on this dialogue, um, um, and there's a couple of questions on um, on HIPAA that um, I'll, I'll save so that my other colleagues get a chance to um, to speak. But I but I will just respond to the question. Um, the one question to how do employers afford to pay for individuals to use telehealth? Um, you know, ultimately, the way that these snap on programs have worked is it's a, you know, it's a per charge and um, and employers that wanted to opt out of that telehealth um, benefit, then they would have had to have opted out of it. So with that, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Preston, who's going to talk more about your workforce. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I, if, if we can, I think the question that was asked about uh, about HIPAA is critical, and I'd like to maybe we should go into that before I go into my slides. And I know you're our resident HIPAA expert. Would you mind addressing that one, uh, just with respect to what can be disclosed and whether there's a, a violation of HIPAA if uh, information is disclosed? I think the question is to what extent does HIPAA for for those who can't see it, to what extent does HIPAA and, and or additional privacy laws and regulations applied to disclosure of an employee health condition to the government? Um, well, I think that what HHS has been saying is, I mean, they've given, um, they have specifically come out and given a, a variety of HIPAA exemptions to covered hospitals. Um, you know, they, they have listed out, you know, like the permission to speak to family, um, privacy notices, a whole variety of relief has been provided directly to covered hospitals. Um, what um, what um, HHS has indicated is that they're aware that you know what is happening is people want to know information about um, like who has coronavirus, of course, and you know that's impactful to both vendors and subcontractors and contractors, and um, and the the real question that has been asked of HHS is what do, what are people to do in this you know in this time period and what HHS has said informally is that, that they understand that um, that you know the minimum necessary um, language of HIPAA will always apply, and so that's of course why when you see um, the reports on in the news every day about it's you know 27 year old male and you know 29 year old male, like the the only information that's being released even to the public is um, gender and age, um, but. Um, information about coronavirus HHS has indicated is um, is within they they've said that, that it's within some of the exceptions to HIPAA but they haven't clarified for us what exact what exact exemptions that we should be relying on um, but I would say that you know it's a very fluid time period and we all need to take the you know that the health and um, welfare of all of our employees seriously and again I don't think our regulators are going to come back and assess um, uh, fines or um, or investigate companies for taking actions that are really intended to, to protect the safety of our employees thank you for that and 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 just to add on very quickly um, if you take a situation for example is I think as Alex described, where maybe some of your employees are embedded with the government 
um, and one of your employees unfortunately does contract the virus, um, a healthcare um, provider uh, can provide information uh, on a need to know basis for the protection of the health of others uh, so that they can determine whether they need to go and get tested as well. So um, uh, to, to Aaron's point, I, th I think that you will, um, you, you're, you're in the clear if you go, if you disclose that information through a healthcare provider in the right way. And that's something we'd be happy to take offline as well. Um, just getting into, into these slides, um, you've received a lot of great information so far. Um, and um, you'll see at the top of my slides, um, I've described it as employment and crisis management. Right? We all know that we're in the middle of a crisis. There's no doubt about it. Uh, every, every way you could look at, look at it, it this, is, this is a crisis. And it's not to raise anxiety, but it's instead um, for us to have an understanding of how we really should approach this, right? So we know that just technically a crisis is an event that has the potential to fundamentally change how you do business and for some, whether you can do business at all. I hope obviously none of you are in that situation. Um, it also includes situations that can fundamentally disrupt your business's relationships with your stakeholders both internal and ex external. Um, Alex and Abby talked about your external stakeholders, uh, namely the government. Um, I'm going to cover your internal stakeholders, which are your employees. Um, one other thing I need to be clear about, um, we know, even though times are tough, um, that like so many crises, we're going to get through this. Um, but we've got to follow some of the right right steps in order to make sure we get through it in the best way possible. Um, normally, in the case of a government shutdown, which maybe some of you um, uh, hopefully didn't experience it, but even if you did, um, uh, it's not something you go through every year. But you know, when you face a government shutdown, um, uh, you have to decide uh, how to deal with a situation where your employees don't have work. That often leads to furloughs, reduced work weeks, and things of that sort. We're, to Alex's point and to Abby's point, we're not at that point right now. We may get there. We may need to have a different discussion as soon as, you know, next week. But, right, we're not at that point right now. Instead, we're dealing with some other concerns, um, employee safety and health. Um, in, in managing this crisis, uh, em employers need to support uh, both um, uh, obviously, first and foremost, the mission, um, which is why we have mission on this slide uh, in red, and it's uh, uh, the priority. Um, the employers are also dealing with competing priorities. Um, on one hand, employers have an obligation to provide a safe workplace for your employees. Um, on the other hand, you have to respect individual employee rights. Um, so when you're providing a safe workplace for your employees, who tells you how you're supposed to do that and how and, and how that's supposed to happen? OSHA does, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Um, on the other side, you've got laws such as the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, FMLA, and others uh, that protect individual employee rights. And of course, uh, discrimination, which there have been some, uh, there's been some concern that uh, uh, there's been some workplace stereotyping taking place um, based on the um, alleged origin of, of uh, COVID-19. We go to the next slide. The, we go to the next slide. Okay. There we go. Um, so, uh, some of the initial considerations as you get into this um, and, and you're thinking about, how, you know, as an employer, how do I deal with this? I'll tell you, first of all, um, like I said before, we're all in the same boat. Um, you know, as a, having been an employer myself, I know that this is not easy. This is probably the most difficult time you could have. Um, the first thing you want to ask is what policies do you presently have in place? Right? Um, I, so, for example, um, there's been some discussion about telework. Do you have something in place for that? Do you have a telework agreement with your employees? Um, are you allowing staggered shifts? Uh, do, 
do you offer the uh, the capacity for, as we have here on this call, video conferencing among your employees using pl platforms like Zoom and Skype and things of that sort? You know, as an employer, you ask yourself, if we don't offer that, why don't we? Now, maybe we can't, but we, let's ask the question. Um, and, and ask another critical question, where are we on paid sick leave? Um, because that obviously is a dominant theme. Um, you'll want to pay close attention to some of the laws that are going through the legislatures now. One of them, which my colleague Jorge Castro will go through in more detail, is the Families First Coronavirus Bill. Um, that should be signed into law soon, um, and, and that will change some of the rights on some of the um, obligations that are under the FMLA in some important ways. Um, another question you want to ask, are our policies consistent with public health recommendations and, and state laws? One of the things that you've got to be close to, and I know all of you are, which is why you're on this call now, is, is the CDC. What is the CDC telling us, right? What are we hearing from, uh, from our state governments? Um, uh, you know, they, they've issued advisories about uh, the number of folks who should gather in one place and, and how long that should take place. Those are things that uh, we should not take lightly and we need to keep uh, uh, the heart. Um, as you're making decisions, walking down this path, trying to figure out what are the right policies that you should have in place, should you have your employees go to work or not, um, you know, and, and if, if you're not, what are the workarounds that you're putting in place? I want to go back to something that I heard um, Alex talk about, which is you need to make sure that you keep your contracting officer in the know. They need to understand um, what they obviously understand as a concept that everybody they're dealing, every company they're dealing with is going through these things. But they need to uh, see what you're going through, and and hopefully it's not just words, but it's also stuff that's in writing, so that five, six, seven months down the line. Um, there's no questions as to what you were doing during this time period. Uh, there are some documents uh, uh, that you should pay attention to uh, and, and read. They're pretty quick reads, uh, guidance documents. Uh, the first being the OSHA's guidance on preparing workplaces um, for the virus. Um, and then more recently, it's temporary enforcement guidance, which, you know, would anyone who's not a lawyer want to read a document that says temporary enforcement guidance? Probably not. But the reality is there's stuff in there that does apply to your day to day and tells you kind of where OSHA is going and what OSHA is expecting. Um, and then there's, of course, the CDC guidance about the virus itself, which is somewhat dated, um, but it still has some important lessons. Go to the next slide. Um, so, let's talk about travel. Um, you know, when I when we first uh, came up with the idea of reaching out to folks and helping them get through this time, right through this uh, uh, through this webcast, uh, I first drafted a number of slides, and frankly, almost all of them are are outdated uh, because it was we're, we, there things are moving so quickly. Uh, we're we're you know uh, going to a situation where um, um, we're not just talking about bans on travel to China or bans on travel to, um, you know, Macau. Um, so, so if we talk, just think about travel for a second. Um, I doubt that uh, you're having to send your employees uh, to places that uh, uh, there's already been a a, a a travel advisory about. Um, uh, but make sure that you know where those those places are. Uh, the president's travel ban, which is essentially a collection of four different uh, uh, requirements, applies to China, Hong Kong, and Macau, Iran, and several places in Europe on the Dissension uh, zone, in addition to the UK and Ireland. Um, uh, it, it tells you that uh, travelers who are not, if you have anybody who's stationed there now, are working there for you now and wants to come back. It tells you that travelers who are not U.S. citizens or permanent residents who are in those affected countries within 14 days from the time that they're trying to come back are are are, are banned temporarily from entering. Um, it's it also tells us that U.S. citizens and U.S. legal permanent residents and other exempted individuals 
um, and their family members under 21 returning from res the restricted uh, countries will be required to travel uh, through certain airports here in the D.C. region. That's uh, uh, Dulles, and I believe up in uh, the, the Boston area, uh, Logan is one of them. Um, and what they have to do when they get to those airports is they are they're subjected to health screenings and they're given further instructions regarding the best health practices, um, um, including a, a mandatory 14 day quarantine. Uh, one of the questions that comes up is, um, okay, fine, we're not sending our employees out. But for some reason, one of our employees uh, has a trip that they want to take, uh, and, and they don't want to um, cancel it. It'll maybe be too costly, or they've been looking forward to it, and they're just not having a true appreciation for the time that we're in. So as an employer, what do I do? Hopefully you can talk them down, but if you can't understand that you do have a right um, to, to, you cannot stop them from traveling. Um, but what you do have a right to do is you do have a right to, um, to tell them that uh, their job can be in jeopardy, that you literally can't let them back into your workplace uh, coming from an affected uh, region. Um, and that right that you have is protected by a number of courts around the country. The EEOC sees it a little bit differently, so you have to be careful of that. Um, but hopefully none of you will be in that situation. Go to the next slide. So we have a few more questions, right? If, if your employees travel to affected areas, what should you do? Uh, Number of steps uh, require them to self quarantine. We've talked about that a little bit. Uh, also require a fitness for duty test before they come back into the workplace. Now that question did come up um, in another form. Uh, can you require a fitness for duty test? The answer is um, if it is um, intended to, uh, if it's triggered by the, you know, your concern about where this employee has traveled, uh, the answer is, to that is yes. And frankly, that's even a certain hotspots in, in the US. If they're coming back from, for example, Seattle, which I'm not sure they could even do, but if they're coming back from Seattle, yes, you can require a fitness for duty test. If, you, if your employees are still working in an office or some other workplace where there's several people uh, congregated. Um, remember that the ADA, Americans with Disability Act, and other restrictions uh, still exist with respect to when you can ask for fitness for duty tests, and we, we would urge you to um, to reach out to uh, a, a lawyer to, to get a better understanding of how to walk that line. Now, what if one of your employees is diagnosed, unfortunately, with the virus? Um, a few more things to think about from an employment standpoint that we've seen employers do. Quickly inform your, your other employees about the potential workplace contamination. Uh, send the contaminated employee home. Um, Obviously, you can't control whether they are actually going to go home, but hopefully they will, and hopefully they won't infect others. Um, there's an obligation, though, to keep in mind uh, that if your employee has uh, contracted the virus because of some exposure at the workplace, you need to log that in just as you would any other um, workplace uh, um, injury. Uh, in, the, in, in the OSHA 300 logs that probably all of you are familiar with. Um, and um, that's also the case, even if the employee doesn't contract it at work, but believes that uh, later they have had to go to the hospital because of some exposure they had uh, at the job. So OSHA 300 obligations presently still apply. Um, right, and also just to add a, a point to that is it's also important because especially as um, a lot of our workforce are, are teleworking, it's important when you log to find out because CDC is going to want to know who else is in the building that day and they'll give you a time frame. So it's, it's important to track these situations. Thank you, Aaron. Um, we had a last point there about HIPAA. We've already kind of covered that a little bit. Um, remember that so, so we just talked about what exists in terms of um, making sure that you provide a safe workplace for employees. Now, on this other side, you've got uh, rights to FMLA, employees have rights to FMLA, um, the, the contaminated employee uh, or, or an employee who has to take care of a contaminated family member. 
they have uh, certain rights under the FMLA provided they worked for you for a certain amount of time um, and you have 50 or more employees. Um, the ADA, uh, reasonable accommodations can be granted. Leave, for example, is something that should be considered um, if you have an employee who um, is has contracted the virus, query whether the virus itself would be considered a disability, but it, it would probably be the safer practice and, and a, a litigation avoiding practice uh, to allow a reasonable accommodation. Um, um, and if there's a question, if the employee wants to take, um, uh, for example, want, wants a reasonable accommodation, but you want them to take FMLA leave, um, the safer practice is to um, allow the employee uh, to take, uh, to choose between the two, and, and hopefully they'll choose the one that affords them the greater rights. Uh, technically, we've seen cases where um, em employers um, were found not to have violated the FMLA um, when they um, uh, forced the employee to take FMLA instead of um, an ADA reasonable accommodation. But again, in order to get the answer as to whether you're right, you may end up in litigation, and that's not a place you want to be. Um, some other OSA uh, consider uh, recommendations, which are important. If you read those guidelines that we mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, definitely uh, you'll you'll get a better understanding of these because of time. I don't want to go through all of them, um, and and some of them have been discussed. Now we just go to the uh, the last slide here. So to do's for employees who are working from home, right? So this is the reality for a number of your employees, right? They're no longer working in a, in a, in a workplace. They're, they're teleworking. Um, you know, WFH is a term that has become more popular over the last week than I think ever before, working from home. Um, establish, so you want to establish compliance and security protocols. Um, uh, for certain types of contracts, establish systems for employee timekeeping and expense reimbursement. I look at this not just from a employment end, but also from a false claims act exposure end as well. Um, uh, you want to determine the, the proper way to have some employee oversight. Um, and that particularly is the case when it comes to um, making sure that uh, cybersecurity is, uh, is, is being adhered to, the cybersecurity requirements that you have in your contracts. Um, how are you protecting confidential, non classified information? or even just general trade secrets. Those are, um, frankly, we could spend an hour on, on, on that topic alone. Um, know that, um, as you've probably seen in the news, uh, some uh, hackers have decided that this is a great time to try and hack into governmental systems uh, because so many people are not um, uh, in the workplace. Um, I'm, the, the, certainly, um, the, there's a, a heightened need to make sure that you, you're complying with those standards. Um, and then the, some of the last things, you know, earlier we said document, document, document. I'll give you another one. Clean, clean, clean. If for some reason your employees are in the uh, workplace and they're not able to work remotely, make sure that you're taking extra precautions uh, to make sure that that workplace is is clean. Um, and that for us, uh, for example, that meant hiring a second shift of folks to clean our office space. Um, and for some, that may mean also when you have an open work environment, uh, constructing additional physical barriers between employees. Um, um, and so um, with that, I'll, I'll leave this to uh, hand it over to, to Jorge and, and look for any questions later. Great. Thank you very much, Preston. Um, I know we're getting close to the limit here, so we want to leave a little time um, for questions uh, that you may have. But um, I'm going to quickly run through um, three tax slides. Um, I know tax isn't always the, the, the sexiest of topics, but it's obviously uh, very important these days as, as your um, business operations uh, uh, are altered. Uh, clearly, that could have implications to your tax obligations um, and, 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 and provide tax risks and opportunities. Um, as Preston hinted, 
Um, I'm going to first talk about kind of what what's Congress and the IRS currently considering, and this is shifting by the minute. Um, we had to update the slides last night. Um, you know, Congress right now is, is still considering the Families First Coronavirus Legislation HR 6201. Um, it's now in the Senate's hands, and they're currently considering it should pass it very soon. That's the expectation. Um, as Preston mentioned, there's a significant changes to um, to sick leave and FMLA uh, laws um, to, to keep in mind um, on the tax side, um, it provides a, a payroll tax credit for paid sick and paid family and medical leave. Um, also, there's a similar credit for self-employed individuals. Um, and there's been a little bit of, of debate about this, but um, who does the credit apply to? And 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 the 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 credit right now as written applies to employers um, with 500 or less employees. Um, and that's something that um, that's a bit unclear, but but I think in 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 the most recent draft that that was clarified. Um, and then you know Congress is looking to enact a larger, broader tax relief legislation uh, very soon, aimed at boosting particular sectors of, of the economy that have been impacted by, by the coronavirus. Um, and we'll talk about that a, a little bit um, in a couple of minutes. Um, also, what's the IRS currently doing? Um, as you saw yesterday, uh, the President and Treasury Secretary Mnuchin announced a 90-day delay for tax payments. Um, that applies for tax payments up to $10 million um, for corporations that, uh, that would otherwise be due April 15th and up to $1 million for individuals. Um, also, that comes with a waiver of penalties and interest as well. Um, the big question mark, um, which is another area of confusion for which I'm sure your, your accounting and tax teams are currently considering is what, is what does that mean for um, the April 15th tax filing deadline. As of now, the tax filing deadline is still in place. Um, that has not changed. Um, so we should all be prepared to file our taxes by April 15th. Um, that could obviously shift any day, any day. But I think as of now, the advice would be to 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 um, to keep uh, on track to filing on, uh, by by the 15th. Obviously, you you always have the right to file for an extension as well, uh, and that's that has not been touched. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, if if we can put the next slide, Abby, or or, or Larry, um, talking a little bit about you know what is you know um, what are potential tax issues that you may be facing right now, and and you know one significant issue that I think that applies to any sector, any industry. Um, would be, you know, how, how losses are treated, um, how losses are, are treated. And, you know, um, there was, a, as you probably know, there was a significant tax reform legislation that was passed by Congress a couple of years ago. And that bill um, had significant limitations to how losses are treated. So this year, you know, you, you, your companies or, or, or your sector um, like many others, are going to experience a significant amount of losses this year. Um, pre-2017, those losses could be carried back um, to other past years where perhaps um, you had significant amount of income that would you could apply those losses retroactively. So this, that's called the, the carryback provision. Um, that's now, um, that's been curtailed. Um, and so in 2017, this tax law got rid of that. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. I think people have not, um, they had not uh, come face to that. Uh, obviously, now this 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 this, this current e economic downturn is is, is going to bring that to bear. Um, so think about that um, as as you consider losses. Also, the 2017 law had other uh, loss limitations uh, with regard to how they interact with um, uh, interact with certain income triggers. And also how they're carried forward as well. So one thing to keep in mind. Um, also, uh, for those you know entities operating internationally, um, you know the 2017 law has has also some limitations to certain deductions that would normally be 
available to you for those companies uh, uh, interacting abroad um, and you know experiencing those losses could could have could could also limit those tax deductions as well um, so just to just give you kind of a, a quick flavor of, of issues that you'd be considering and as as you discuss um, with your accounting and tax teams um, also just to wrap up with the last section here is you know, what does the crystal ball tell us about 2020 and, 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 and the future outlook? For the IRS, um, they are, you know, they are continuously kind of um, providing more guidance about extension of deadlines and easing of, uh, of enforcement actions. Um, um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, they are relaxing rules around collection notices. Um, also, um, um, Levies that, that would otherwise be imposed as well. Um, obviously, something for you to think about is if you are currently under exam by the IRS, um, um, thinking about obviously how that would impact your audits and 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 particular response that you would provide to the IRS. I think I think that that the pronouncements from leadership at the IRS to to examiners has been to 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 ease some of those enforcement actions. So. Something for you to keep in mind, but obviously keeping that open line of communication with any an auditor um, would be very important, um, and obviously documenting that. Um, on the congressional side, um, there's going to be a robust legislative package, as I, as, as I mentioned, aimed at boosting the economy and, and injecting cash into our economy. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and then the question becomes, what are the types of issues that Congress could consider. Um, if you can just go to the next slide, please. Um, and as you'll see here, um, the, the list, this is a very, this is a, a select list of issues that Congress could consider. Um, and it's gonna be very broad. And, and this list is, is getting broader by, by the hour. One is, um, as we talked about providing relief around net operating losses, right? So allowing, um, uh, potentially allowing companies to, to carry back those losses and carry forward. Um, I think that's that's I suspect that's going to be an area that Congress is going to really look into very closely. Um, so look for that. Also, there's the, the larger discussion about a payroll tax holiday, or as the president um, hinted at yesterday, kind of direct payments um, or checks. Um, that's on the table. Um, looking at past issues that Congress has considered, um, they've provided hiring tax incentives for hiring workers, also in tax incentives for retaining workers as well. Um, something to keep in mind, um, interest expense deduction relief, um, trying to enhance charitable contributions as well. Um, so increasing those incentives, um, enhancing R&D incentives, um, also allowing folks to use retirement funds uh, without penalty as well uh, during these tough e economic times. And also, um, as we've talked about, as you've probably read in the news, a lot of discussion about bailing out, providing tax relief to the airline industry. Um, I suspect there's going to be a lot of discussion around that. So um, that's going to be ongoing. Um, I, I highly encourage you to kind of keep um, keep engaged, keep very close attention to what Congress is, is considering. And I think my last piece of advice would be is if there are issues that you are considering or, or that are impacting your sector specifically, um, the time is now to engage Congress um, and to go to them um, with your issues that you are facing. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. I know we're we're cutting it close on or a little bit over on time. If anybody has any questions, you can feel free to. Um, I think we hit all of the ones that we received in the chats, but feel free to send them now. Um, otherwise, I'm, we're going to send out the recording. We'll also send the slides. You'll have all of our contact information, and feel free to get in touch if you have any follow ups or we didn't address. What, what your concerns are right now, we're all available for you. And we're looking forward to uh, meeting you all in person sometime soon as well. I don't see any more chats coming in, so. I would say we're, I think we're good. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks everyone.